That's how this works. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get started in a minute or two. Let's share the screen. And can you guys see the Myron Comos now? Yes. Yeah, you're all good. Okay, good. Okay. And then, okay, so. Okay. Get started in just a minute or two here. Okay. So let's get started. Um, Whoever's here is here, whoever is not is either late or not going to be here. Okay, so we are going to be looking at um, what I thought was going to be one mitzvah. Um, I thought that we, I want, I, when I started learning this, this topic, I was looking at the mitzvah of what I thought was to fast on Yom Kippur. That's what I was, uh, that's what I started off and I assumed I'd be learning. Um, and it, it makes sense to think that way because the mitzvah is his anos, the yud tishrei, to fast on the 10th of tishrei. So if that's the mitzvah, as the Rambam puts in his introduction to the laws of Yom Kippur, uh, so then that would make sense that, uh, that that should be the laws that I was, uh, that we'd be studying, right? Why would I think otherwise? Um, I was in for, for quite a surprise. Um, I was really, uh, I, was, I was in for a, uh, for a big surprise when, as I learned the sugya, so as you learn every single topic, you tend to figure out things that you didn't know before. I mean, learning would be quite boring um, if it was otherwise. So, uh, so I thought this um, was a fundamental um, new understanding that I did not have before. Um, this, was, this was completely different. Um, I have a whole new appreciation for the laws of Yom Kippur that I didn't beforehand, um, and things that I simply didn't know, um, and was was really things that I was pretty much 100% um, confident about that I knew and would teach and, and tell people about, um, I was completely wrong about. And I think that many, many people are actually wrong about it, and I don't think they realize. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I just think that it requires studying, and, uh, and this is not anything that, like, required tremendous analysis. It just required paying attention to the words and paying attention to the, uh, to the sources. If, uh, as long as I paid attention to, to what I was reading, um, so then, uh, so then I, was, I, I just like knew this up of knowledge. It was like really an amazing experience. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that's one, yeah, I, I know that we, um, everybody asked if, we could, if I could focus on uh, Pedagog, uh, pedagogy and, uh, um, and methodology. So just one tip and methodology that I learned from Rakai Nilsson Shlita, who was a big, uh, big student of Salvechik. So he, he prepares on average 10 to 15 hours for each year, which I used to think was absurd. Uh, I used to be able to figure things out in an hour or two, so I didn't know why it took him so long. So, uh, so I used to think it was absolutely crazy until you, as you begin to know more, you begin to really, I know it's a cliche, like the more you know, the, the more you realize you don't know, but it really becomes true. It really becomes that, that yeah, there's a basic level that you understand, but then as you start like uh, realizing that there's just so much more out there, you realize you don't know so much. And then so I asked Wilson, um, what is he spending the most amount of time on? And another time I asked him, how he solves a lot of the problems that he finds while he learns. Um, and the both answers were the same, which was just read the text. And as simple as that sounds, he didn't mean to, to just read the text once or twice, um, as opposed to like just assuming what the text said. What he meant was read the text like 20 or 30 times. Just read the words over and over. And what begins to happen is your mind starts to pick up on things that they did, it didn't see the first seven, eight, 10, 15 times. And you start seeing things that you didn't see before. This is a classic example. There are the Ran um, in this uh, in this sugya that we've seen. I've, I've read this Ran probably 20 times in my life and I've taught it probably about 20 times in my life. And there's something I saw this time 
that I'd never seen before. And it's not something novel. It's not like a breakthrough. It's literally just what he says. But because the first 20 odd times that I read it, I assumed uh, what he said, as opposed to actually reading what he said. So I never really picked up on what he said. So, uh, so like uh, now we're going to be able to, and it, and it opened up a whole new area of, at least in my understanding of Hilchus Yom Kippur. It could be that you'll either say, oh, I knew that already. Or it could be that you'll say, I don't really see why that's so novel, but I promise you it really is tremendously novel, okay? This is like, uh, we're gonna really see something that we that we didn't know beforehand. Um, okay, now, Rabbi, yes. Before you begin, um, yeah. do you find the same repetition helpful in things like West Wing? Like, do you find new things in, okay, in well, that? I I hear you. Okay, so now, okay, so, uh, so now we, uh, so now we, we come to, uh, to a different idea, which is that, uh, that mitzvos, um, mitzvos are connected, obviously. So, you know, different than the, uh, the 613 mitzvos are obviously are connected. But at the same time, they're also individual units um, and on their own exist as individual units and have their own ideas. So although, yes, one mitzvah will be connected to another, there are two of the 613 mitzvos are wearing your tefillin on your arm and tefillin on your head. Very hard to say that those two mitzvahs aren't connected, right? The question really is why they're two separate mitzvahs. But generally, okay, generally mitzvahs are individual units, but there are always connections. Here we're going to toe the line between a between two individual mitzvahs, but see that they are very much connected, okay? And that too was uh, was very novel for me to uh, to see, okay. So let's look at the, just, uh, I'm going to go through quickly through a couple of the questions because they're, they're, really, uh, they're really important to focus on. I know that I went through some of them in the introductory video, but I really want to make sure that we're, that we're cognizant of them as we go through um, so that we we're, we're, like, really know what we're talking about here and what we're going to focus on. So some of the more minor questions, I won't go through all the sources, and then we're going to read that Ron really, really carefully, okay? I want to really read it through because... Again, I know I read the Ran um, and I read it slowly in the in the introductory video, but the reading of the Ran, just the simple reading of the Ran, is so important to understand this. So you, okay? So uh, so if you if you uh, have the source sheets here on the screen, um, so as I read that Ran, when we get to it, it's not for a little while, but as we get to it, please pay attention word by word. Okay. So the first thing is very important is the uh, is the first source, the Sefer Mitzvahs of the Rambam, and here in the Sefer Mitzvahs of the Rambam. Uh, the Rambam said he, he he like he goes back and forth. It's very strange, and this really opens up uh, to to try to figure out what's going on. This is the 164th mitzvah, and that mitzvah is as he starts off. He says lis anos basiri v'tishrei to fast on the 10th of Tishrei. Okay, very simple. What's the mitzvah? I have to fast. When the 10th of Tishrei. Is there really much anything else I need to know? Right? That seems to be as clear as can be. There really isn't so much to understand there. Okay? Um, and then so he explains how you, how you understand what, uh, what, 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 you know, how, how we get to fasting and why it's, it's specifically eating and drinking we know we have to stay away from. Okay, fine, so good. Okay. But then he says that we also learned by way of tradition that it's Aser Berechitza, Vesicha, Nyasa, Sandal, Tash, that there are four other actions that are also prohibited. Right now, these four other actions. Okay, good. So they're prohibited. We learn them from tradition. Now, what would I automatically say? Where are those four mitzvos? What? Where are they extensions of? What are they extensions of? Right. All mitzvos, all laws that we have, have to be tied into somehow. Have to be tied into uh, one of the 613 mitzvos. Okay, they have to be tied. So here, I'm learning about one of the mitzvos. It's in the Sefer mitzvos. I'm learning about the 164th mitzvah. So what is this an extension of? What's the obvious conclusion I'm going to draw? It must be an extension of the mitzvah of, of, of fasting on the 10th of Tishrei, which then begs the question, how do I get from fasting to not wearing shoes, to not, uh, not showering, all the other four things? So how do I get to that? So then, right, then the Rambam says something very strange. The hashvisa mechayeves me'la pulos kulam. So he says, hold on a second. He says, there's a phrase by Yom Kippur that says Shabbat Shabbaton. 
like a double Shabbos. Okay, fine. So that's what teaches me the other four. Okay, but wait a minute. That's not fasting. Fasting is vanisem es nashol sechem or tanu es nashol sechem. That's something else. You just use a whole different phrase. What does it have to do with fasting on, uh, okay, you were telling me it's, it's Shvisa? Fine, Shvisa is the next mitzvah. That's the 165 5th mitzvah. That's Shvisa. There's a, there's, a pro, there's a mitzvah to rest on Yom Kippur. Well, we generally, just like we have a mitzvah to rest on Shabbos, we have a mitzvah to rest on Yom Kippur, a mitzvah to rest on every single Yom Tov. I get that, fine. So tell me, is this, are these four extensions of fasting or of these part of the next mitzvah. And if they're part, if they're extensions of fasting, then just say they're extensions of fasting. Don't bring in Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbaton. And if they're part of Shabbat Shabbaton, then don't discuss them here. Discuss them in the next mitzvah. What do they have to do with this mitzvah? Does everybody see the problem? That's the essential, that's, that's the problem. Now here's it just colloquially. Okay, I'll throw in a question colloquially that I didn't list in the, in the questions beforehand. If you ask somebody, what are you not allowed to do on Yom Kippur? Okay, they're going to tell you in rabbinic language the hey inuyim. Okay, the five pains. That's what they're called, the five pains, meaning that not eating and drinking, right? Or, and the other four, the not putting on shoes, the not, not being intimate, the, all the other five, those are called five inuyim, meaning they're all in one category. That's how they're referred to. But now we're splitting them up while also including them together in one thing. How does it work? You gotta pick one way or the other. Everybody see the problem? Okay, I hope so. Okay, so, uh, so that's, that's in essence the, the, big, the big problem that I have. Okay, um, then you have, and, and the question becomes, right? Like uh, how do we understand the painting your soul? What's the connection between, between right? Why do we paint our soul? Not philosophically, but where it sort of helps us with kapara, right? And it's strange. And then you have to ask the question, what does Shabbat Shabbaton mean? What does that mean, Shabbat Shabbaton, or rest of rests? What is that? Right? What is Shabbat Shabbaton? That also it begs the question. How, how do we understand what that phrase, what's that coming to tell you? On Shabbat and on Yom Tov, I have the phrase Shabbat. I have to rest. Shvisa. That's one of the positive commands. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to show every single one of those of, of every single Yom Tov has its own mitzvah, the 613, to rest on it. So Rosh Hashanah's rest is different than Sukkot's rest. And Sukkot's is different than Pesach. They're all different than Shemini Yatsaris. Each of them have, has a Shvisa. But here on Yom Kippur, it's not enough for us to say Shvisa. We don't even do this on Shabbos. We say Shabbat Shabbaton. So what does that mean, Shabbat Shabbaton? Okay, good? Okay, so that's like, uh, that's, the, that's, the next, that's the next question I had. Okay. Um, okay, then I wanted to know, okay, um, well, well, what's the, uh, okay, essentially, where do we get these, these four other Inuyim from? There's another question I wanted to know, okay, and, uh, the big, and if you say to me, okay, what's the difference between fasting and the other four inuyim, the other four things that, that we paint ourselves with. So what's the big difference between them? Okay, so, right, so they're all five different actions. They're all five things that lead me to pain. They're all five things I have to do on Yom Kippur. What's the big difference between them? And the biggest difference you see between them is the punishment you get by, by, by violating them. When it comes to eating and drinking on Yom Kippur, if I do that on purpose, so then what do I have to do? I've got to go ahead and I've got to, uh, I've got, I uh, get caris, right? So that's car. That's a, the, the most severe punishment at caris, okay? If I, the other four, I get lashes. I'm not saying the lashes aren't bad, but they're nowhere near caris, right? So what's the, uh, so uh, why is it, right? What, what, what makes eating and drinking um, is such a, such a harsh punishment while the other four are not as, uh, as harsh, okay? That's uh, that's what I want to understand as well. Okay, and lastly, something that I think wasn't wasn't such a big deal, but I really think it is now. Um, the Rambam calls it's very interesting. If you look up all the Chagim in the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, 
Okay, so if you look at the Chagim, so there none of, there's no such thing as like the Shulchan Aruch has Hilchos Pesach, and it has Hilchos Sukkot, and it has Hilchos Chanukah, and it has Hilchos Purim. The Rambam doesn't name the laws of the festivals in, with those names. Okay, so Hilchos Pesach is not called Hilchos Pesach. It's called Hilchos Chametzu Matzah. Hilchos Rosh Hashanah is not called Hilchos Rosh Hashanah. It's called Hilchos Shofar. Hilchos Sukkah, you follow the trend here, is not called it's not called Hilchos Sukkot. It's called Hilchos Sukkah Shofar Lulav. Okay, and if you uh, sorry, yeah, Shofar Lulav because it combines Rosh Hashanah in the same category. Okay. Um, Hilchos Purim and Chanukah are not called Hilchos Purim and Chanukah. They're called Hilchos Megillah and Chanukah, okay? And, uh, and so on and so forth, right? I'm sure I'm missing something there. But that's, uh, that's the idea. Um, so what's, what's, hap- what's going on there, right? So why is it that the Rambam doesn't call them by the names of the festivals? So uh, very interesting. What's he doing, right? On Rosh Hashanah, he calls it Hilchos Shofar, right? So it's after the object of the mitzvah of the day. Right, same thing. Pesach, chametz matzah, the objects of the mitzvahs of the day. Okay, on uh, Sukkot, same thing. Sukkah, lulav. Right? Why? Because those are the mitzvahs of the day. You following the trend here? Okay. Yom Kippur. So I would say call it Yom Kippur, but it's not Yom Kippur. What about Shabbos? What would you call Shabbos? Right. So oddly enough, Shabbos is called Hilchos Shabbos. So wait, it's not fair. Hold on a second. Well, what, we, what should you call it based on the Right, if you follow the trend, it's like an SAT question, right? So if you follow the trend, what would you call Hilchos, uh, Hilchos Shabbos, right? And what would you call Hilchos Yom Kippur, right? So the Rambam calls Hilchos Shabbos, Hilchos Shabbos, and he calls Hilchos Yom Kippur, Hilchos Shvisas Asar, the halachos of resting on the 10th day. So as if the object of the mitzvah on Shabbos is the Shvisa, and the same thing is true on Yom Kippur. The object of the day, the mitzvah of the day, is Shabbos, is resting, refraining. It's very strange, because that's not, not, there's no object, right? So why is the Rambam calling Hilchos Yom Kippur, Hilchos Shvisa Sasar, the laws of resting on the 10th, meaning the 10th of Tishrei? Okay, good. But Rabbi, and why wouldn't for Shabbos, and I, I know one of the answers is just because it wasn't, but like Shammor Vizachor, rather than rest. Well, a Shamar Rezachor would be Hilchos Kiddush then. Okay. Okay. Right? That, that's the mitzvah. Shamar Rezachor, right? Shammar, not Shamar so much, but Zachor would be Hilchos Kiddush. You know, the real question is, what, what's, what, if I would ask you, okay, in Rosh Hashanah we have Shofar, on Sukkot we have Lula, right? what's the object of the mitzvah on Shabbos? So what did you say? Kiddush right. No, right? certainly not. Right? right. So that's the, so, right? So that's the, that becomes the question. Good. Okay. Anyone have any other questions that they came up with or as far as that they want to offer? No one. Okay. Lots of participation. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So this is like the, the most unparticipatory shear that, uh, that I think I've ever, it's like three in a row now, right? Because our third shear. So this is, uh, this is the, the, at least we're consistent. Okay. So it's about the only positive thing I can say about it. Okay, so uh, okay, so let's see here. Okay, uh, I'll tell you what uh, what my what my svar is. This is this is my svar. We'll uh, build uh, build my svar here. Okay, and the first thing is we have to see before we yeah we say like this. Okay, uh, let's look at the Ron first. Okay, let's look at uh, this is source number number ten. Let me put it down here. So you, you can see it on the screen here if you don't have it. Okay, so here's here's source number ten. So we're gonna and now it's long. I, I understand it's long, and uh, but I really think it pays to read it through. Um, again, I know we read it through, but I really uh, this time we're gonna read it through, and I'm gonna put the emphasis on what I've missed my whole life, and that way we can really see because what the Ran is gonna do for us, unlike the Rambam, the Ran says exactly the same thing as the Rambam. Okay, he is saying exactly the same thing. I'm, I'm convinced as the Rambam, but the Rambam says it in three lines. The Ran takes about 15. So what the Ran is doing is he's expanding the understanding so you can really see it, okay? So uh, so here we go, okay? So the Ran says as follows. Cool, okay, and just so we understand what he's grappling with is our issue. Where are these other four? What, what are the nature of these other four things? 
right? The four inuim that we have, the the wash, the not forbid, the prohibition of washing, the prohibition of anointing yourself with oil, the prohibition of intimate relations, and the prohibition of wearing shoes. So what are, what's the nature of those uh, of those four things? Where do they come from? That's what the Ron is grappling with. Okay, everybody got it? Okay, so the Ron is going to open up by explaining um, what it can't be. Okay, he's going to use a process of elimination to show you what it can't be, and then direct you because it can't be A, it must be B. The A is a Daraisa, it can't be a Daraisa, therefore it must be Durabanan, and then he's going to end up somewhere in the middle. Okay, that's where we're, that's the direction that we're going. So that was a spoiler alert. Okay, only he said it afterwards. Okay, so Kud, uh, it says like this right? Okay, we know that they're Isuro Diko. We know that they're Osir, right? They're for sure Osir, okay? Aval Kares Leika, right? But we know that they don't get Kares, okay? So now we separate them. We know that there's a difference between them and fasting. Right? We know that they're they're only Durabadam. Vafal got the Gemara, Mafaki Lahu, Mafaki Lahu Mikroi, Right, so now even though the Gemara, when it lists these four, it brings down a pasuk for them, right? So, but this pasuk is something called a smachta bi'alma, you know, right? So that means that it's just a hint, meaning this isn't where we learn it. The pasuk, if you read the pasuk, you wouldn't read the pasuk and say, oh, now I know I can't wear shoes on Yom Kippur. It's just hinted towards it, okay? It's not the, it's not like a pasuk that says now you can't do it. Not only that. Okay, but we find a leniency when it comes to these. Okay, now the rabbanon cannot be lenient. There's a principle we have to know: the rabbanon cannot be lenient on a Torah prohibition. They have no right to do that. This is God's word, right? The rabbis can't come along and say, "Oh, in this case, we could be lenient on a Torah." Pro-. No, it's a Torah prohibition. You have no right to do that. On a rabbinic prohibition, they can institute certain rules within the rabbinic prohibition. So that we, so that those rules exist, and we don't have to follow the, the rabbinic prohibition when these situations exist. So, for instance, if somebody is sick, okay, we're gonna see this in a second. If somebody is sick, the, the, the rabbinic prohibition doesn't apply to somebody who is sick. Okay, that's a rule the rabbis made. Whenever they made a mitzvah, they said, right, this is a, this is a rabbinic institution. It does not apply if somebody is sick. That's a rule. You can't do that when it comes to the Torah prohibition if God didn't do it, which is why even if you're a little ill on Yom Kippur, you still have to fast because it's a Torah prohibition and fasting is a Torah prohibition and the rabbis don't have the right to go ahead and say, if you're a little sick, then we can be lenient with you. Okay? Got to be really sick on Yom Kippur to eat. Okay. Right? So uh, so it says that a, that a king and a, and, a, and a bride, okay, a king, a king and a bride can, uh, a king and a bride can go ahead and, uh, and what's well, the king and the bride can uh, um, can wash their faces on Yom Kippur. Okay, it's not nami by chayat sandal. Not only that, but it says that a, uh, that a, a um, uh, I just want to recognize my father's coming. Give me one second here. Uh, I assume my father can hear me now, so I just want to welcome my father. Okay, so a uh, so it says that uh, that a woman that just gave birth is allowed to wear shoes. Damar Lazar v'chacham osrim. They say not even in the time they didn't see she has sakana. Fine, so the is and the loss is the loss of Sando Midoraisa, right? So how could a Lazar allow, right? How could he allow a woman to wear shoes if this is a Torah prohibition? Therefore, right, what must we say? We must say that this the, the wearing shoes is a Durabana, right? Uh Gumara Nami Arena, Demishi Yishlo Khatatim Barosho. Sachidarko, we have no shame. Shrine, someone has a, it's something wrong with the head. They're like they have a, like a, some sort of a, a skin, uh, like a probi- like something on their skin and their heads. So they're allowed to put oil on. Amishi yadio mukolachas betitu betzoa rochis kedarko. If your hands get dirty, right? There's actual dirt on your hands, so you're allowed to wash them. We have no shame. You don't have to worry. If these things are chitzia, they're aisa. They know hechi mekina behu, right? And if these things are Torah prohibitions, how could you uh, how could you be lenient on them? How can the rabbi tell you you're allowed to wash your hands? So he says that it must be, right? It must be that this is, these are only, uh, these are only Durabana prohibitions. Right? So where are these five, uh, these five paints, where are they, uh, like, connected? What are they, what are they according to? Uh, it says, where are these according to? It doesn't say, where do we learn them from? When I want to know a Torah prohibition, what do I say? 
may not be late. Where do we get this from, right? But if I want to know how the rabbi is instituted, I say Kineget. And here, the Gemara asks Kineget. It doesn't ask Minan Amili, where do we learn them from? Meaning that there are, the Gemara, when it asks the question, it assumes that it's Darabana. Okay. Now, like that, we see that the only time you get a punishment of kares, right, is if you've uh, if you violated the uh, the Torah prohibition of eating and drinking and doing moacha. That's it. So the other ones can't be daraisa. Okay, so now, so he says, here we go. This is the important part, okay? Watch this. I'm going to see if I can I do this here. Hold on. On the screen here. Okay. Okay. So here, look what he says here. Okay, so he says, I, I think I highlighted it here. He says as follows. Uh, okay, so, Lefiha Chaya Nirali. Okay, here yeah, from here. Lefiha Chaya Nirali. So, this is what he says. Therefore, this is what I say. So, he's established already that it's not Daraisa, that it must be Darabad. Everybody following so far? I know it's very long. Everybody following? Okay, so so far, what he's saying is it's not Daraisa and must be Darabad. And now we still haven't solved. What's the problem we still haven't solved? Okay, so now we know that they're, they're a button. He's established that clearly, right? In many, many different ways, whether by the difference of punishments, by the fact that they're a button or make ill, right? That they're lenient in this certain areas, by the fact that the Gemara asks, right? Uh, according to how do the rabbis instituted it, didn't ask from where do we know it, right? And he has many, many proofs that this must be a button. Okay, so now I know that they're, they're a button, but, right, but, he, well, he hasn't told us what they are, where we get them from. What are these? I know they're Durabonans. But Durabonan what? Durabonans either come to, to, uh, to make sure that I don't sin, right? They're like a fence around the Torah. Or they come to, uh, they come to, to enhance something, right? They come to enhance a, uh, it's like, sorry, Kiddush on Shabbos morning is Durabonan because it comes to enhance my Shabbat meal on Shabbos morning. Without Kiddush, what would make it so special, right? So what are these? What are these? Well, there, there are buttons. What do the rabbis come up with them for? For what purpose? What do they do? Right? What's their, not philosophically, but halakhically, what's their objective here? What are they? Everybody see the question? Okay, that's the last thing the Ram has not, has not really solved for us. So here he says, he says, So he, he flips things around and he says, no, they're really Doraisa. So who? That's a bichidish, right? What do you mean they're really Doraisa, right? So he says, uh, right, they're really Daraisa. Ella, the cave and the loud, the cloud, inui, the chsili, the kra, me the high, me Daraisa, ninhu, right? So, but they can't be considered inui. They can't be considered pain. Listen to that again. They can't be considered inui. They can't be considered pain. In the beginning, remember what we said? In the beginning, we said that fasting is pain. Right, and if you remember from the introductory video, we said what kind of pain is it? It's pain that takes away from the soul. What's that pain? Eating and drinking. Right, fasting is the only type of pain that we consider pain. That's the only pain that we consider pain is fasting. The pasuk, right, says that's the that's the pasuk. The pasuk is essentially telling us that pain, that fasting is pain. That's it, fasting. These four things don't relate to fasting, in which case they can't be pain. So they're Torah prohibitions, he says, right? Okay, they're from the Torah, but they're not related to pain. Okay. Contemplate that for a second. If they're not Inui, and they're right, and they're but they're they are prohibited from the Torah, what are they? Right? Okay, so he goes on. Everybody see? He's really, he's really like walking us through this. So he says, he says, Ella mi ribui de shabasoni asu, right? Could ease the Gemara kili tfei umasar akasav chachamim. Rather, they're extensions of the next mitzvah of shabaso. This is huge. This is groundbreaking, novel. 
They have nothing to do with Inui. It, it, yes, we call them the Hei I have absolutely no idea why after learning this Ran. I do not know why, especially since the Rambam is going to repeat, or he said it before the Ran, because it came before the Ran, but, he said, but he's going to say the same thing as the Ran. So I don't know why we call these the Hei Where are they learned from? They're actually part of the next mitzvah of Shvisa, of resting on Yom Kippur. Right? That's, the, that's where it comes from. And what is it? The Torah says that you have, God says you have to rest on Yom Kippur, okay? It says you have to rest on Yom Kippur. And the rabbis came along. They were given, Masran HaKasul L'Chachamim. That God turns to the Chacham and says, you define what the rest should look like. It's up to you, Chachamim. You define, you name it, you list it. What is it? What should it look like? And the Chachamim came up with these four things. But they're coming up, these four things that the Chachamim are coming up with are the, just simply defining the Torah's idea of Shavisa. That's incredible. The rabbis come along and say, okay, Yom Kippur, we have a special Shavisa, Shabbos Shabbosot, Shabbat Shabbatot. It's a special Shavisa. It's a special rest. Now God says to the Chachamim, you define what that rest should look like. It's going to look different than Shabbos. It's going to look different than Yom Tov. It's not about the 39 malachos here, right? That's not what we're talking about. Rather, it's going to be with these four areas. That It's four other refrains, to put it the best in English that I can, okay? It's, it's four other things that we refrain from. We refrain from washing, we refrain from intimacy, we refrain from shoes, and we refrain from, uh, from uh, perfumes and oils. That's the unique Shabbat Shabbaton. John? Yeah, so do we have the, any, uh, and I don't think you covered this in the pre share like when were these instituted by the Chachamim and was there any other ones instituted that are no longer or was there a machlokes of sorts of what these were or do in some sense Torah Misenai that they came down from that time period and that was that? No, 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 so they didn't come down Torah Misenai. That's for sure not. Well, the, that's that time period. No, no, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know time period. That I don't know. I don't know if like the Jews in the first four Yom Kippurs were wearing right, shirts. Right. I'm not sure. That I don't know. I don't know exactly. So do, we know if there was, do we know if there was a machlokas of, hey, we should have these four? Someone said, no, we need seven. And now we kind of got right, so I, I don't. I, right. So I don't, I don't know of any recorded instance like that. It could be that there's a Gemara out there that I'm just not familiar with, but I don't know of one. Right? It seems to be that these are all like uh, pretty much accepted. Um, and without my focus, there's no community in, in, in Israel today, right? I don't mean the state of Israel. I mean like the Jewish people that doesn't, that don't, that doesn't do these things or do more that I know for sure. Yeah, that, that I know. Okay. So, uh, I, I pretty much, as much as I know, I know, right. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it could be like, so, yeah, I don't know if the Ethiopians were doing this, you know, I have no idea. Okay. So, uh, so that's the, right. So that's the, that's, that's what the Ron says. Okay. Um, and therefore, the rabbis were allowed, even though it's Daraisa, they were allowed to be lenient in these areas because it was them that instituted it, right? Now, look what the Rambam says. You see, the Rambam is going to say just about the same thing, okay? The Rambam says, I guess, we're looking at source number 13, okay? And look what the Rambam says, okay? He says, uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, 13. Hold on, 13. Okay, and therefore we also learn, and Mipia Shmu is a difficult uh, phrase that the rabbi uses. It could be that he learns, it means we learn it from a pasuk, a big machokasim as to what Mipia Shmu means in the rabbi. Okay, but it doesn't mean, it definitely does not mean that there's a pasuk that's, that straight out tells us what to do. Like, for instance, eating and not eating and drinking on Yom Kippur, if you look at source number 12, he says, Mitzvah Saseh Acheres Yesh Yom Kippur, right? The Lishbos, right? Those are, that's right, Lishbos Miachil of Ashtia. He says it straight out, okay? This is different. Right? So all these things you can't do. Um, okay? And there's a mitzvah to, to, uh, to, to stop these um, just like there is from eating and drinking. Right? To, to show base, to refrain from. Shemar Shabbat Shabbaton, right? Shabbat l'inyan achilah v'shabbat l'inyan melu. 
right? There's a Shabbat for, for eating and a Shabbat for these four things. That's a huge fish. I would have thought the first Shabbat was from Malacha, right? The 39 Malacha, so like I'm not allowed to do it in Shabbos. And this other Shabbos one was something new. The, sh- the first Shabbos, says the Rambam, is for eating and drinking. And the second Shabbos, Shabbat, and then Shabbaton is for these four. And don't confuse this with fasting, because fasting, you get karis for. But if you violate any of these four, you get makas mardos. Okay? Completely different, uh, completely different thing. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like two things. First of all, it sounds like the Rambam is saying that if you have the first Shabbat referring you to eating and drinking, and that's a Doraisa. So if you have the second word Shabbaton, why isn't the other four in Uyim then also a Doraisa? It's the same Pusik, it's the same word Shabbat, eating and drinking, Shabbaton, the other four in Uyim. Why? What makes that all of a sudden a lesser category? Ah, so it's so, a different so part of the, the same thing. Ah, so look at the Lecha Mishnah. The Lecha Mishnah is source number 14. Okay? The Lecha Mishnah says, V'chein lomdu mi pi ashmua. Kasav arav amagvim, nifre bidivrei sofrim, achar shehu inyam yucha v'pnei atzma. Okay, if you are with Dvaro, so let's explain. And he says, Da'afal pi shemin haroi ha'ilam noso mitzvah sa'ase, right? Shehari kra de shabaso and rabba, shinui ha'kasav hu, v'hubba. Right? So th- really, these should be their own 613. Now, the Shabbaton should be another one in 613. So you should have one of the 613 is fasting, one of the 613 is not doing work on Yom Kippur, and another one of these four. So it's really, that's what it should have been. Right? And uh, that's my father's question. But he can't be, because it's not Inui. So, okay, so that's so take that out. So it can't be its own Inui, right? Can't be its own that. About zehu davar acher miyuchav efnei atzmo shirabo so kasum mikar de shabasa v'lo shigala lano kasum. Right. So because the Torah doesn't say it, because the Torah doesn't say these things, rather they're they're revealed through shabasa, right? Rather, right? It's only by studying shabasa that we come to these four things. So therefore, it can't be its own mitzvah. In other words, if this was listed in the Torah, if I read through the Torah and I found these, like I found not eating and drinking, like I found not doing work, then great. But the Torah doesn't say this. Rather, it has a concept. All it has is a concept. It has Shabbos on it. It's just a concept. And therefore, since it's just a concept, the actual mitzvahs, the, 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 the actions, the prohibitions, or the mitzvahs in this case, I don't know what they are. right? And therefore, they don't get counted as their own mitzvah. Okay, that's that's how the Lecha Mishnah explains the Rambam and I think also the Ran. Okay, okay. So let's let's give a svara to explain the this uh, these two mitzvahs. Okay, and the two mitzvahs I'm referring to now, okay, are Inui and Shvisa. Okay, so here's what here's what we're gonna say. You ready? This is uh, this is what I think. The mitzvah of Inui, and you know what? Now that I think about it. Yeah, let's see. Okay, the mitzvah of Inui is to refrain from uh, from pleasure in order to bring pain. It sounds very like not Jewish, but it is. It's a yeah. And this is Yom Kippur. It's a different story. Okay. So on Inui, what am I supposed to do? I'm re- I'm a su- supposed to refrain from pleasure in order to bring pain. That's what the mitzvah of Inui is. The what's the ma'aseh mitzvah? What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to refrain from eating in order to bring the kiyum of pain. But the act of refraining is extended to four other actions. Okay? They're also refrains. But those refrains are not the same idea to bring pain. They're extensions of shabbason, of refraining. They're not the same idea of bringing pain. The, the idea is to ref, is refraining in its own right, okay? And that refrain you see from Shabbat Shabbaton. It's an extension of, of Shabbat Shabbaton, not of, of refraining, okay? Is, is that clear? Yeah, I, I think it's clear, but, and 
this might get into the category of why, and we're not going to discuss the why, so to speak, but what were the, the rabbis trying to accomplish from those four refrains? Was it like, what's the, the concept behind the goal of those? So, so besides, here's the thing. besides defining Shvisa. So the question only exists if we understand the four as rabbinic. Your question only exists, right, in a logic sense, if we understand the four as rabbinic, but they're not. That's the Ron's novelty. Well, right? Let, let, me just, let me just finish. Let me just okay, finish. Let me sure. finish. Let me finish. I, I know exactly what you're asking, and I want to okay. show you why the why I think I know um, why the question the question doesn't is it doesn't really hold true. Okay. When the rabbis institute something, there's an halachic objective that they're trying to accomplish with their institution, right? Okay. So again, they use the idea of muksa, right? So muksa, you say you can't bring, you can't move a pen on Shabbat because they don't want you writing. Very simple. Okay, great. Okay, good. So that's the halachic objective. It's not a philosophical question. It's a halachic question. What's the objective of the uh, of the of the institution? Okay, good. Okay. So that would make sense here. And that's how we started off by assuming, right, that these four were rabbinic. That's what the Ron said. The Ron brought three proofs to show that they're rabbinic, that they have to be rabbinic. But then the Ron said, no, look, you have, the Ron's introducing a whole new category to us, okay? He's saying that you have Torah prohibitions and you have rabbinic prohibitions, okay? But then you have something in the middle, which are Torah prohibitions, the concept is the Torah, but God handed off the definition of these Yisurim to the rabbis. So the rabbis here, John, are not trying to reach a halachic objective. They're trying to accomplish the, the, uh, the Torah prohibition, the Torah concept of Shabbat. So on Yom Kippur, there's supposed to be something new that we refrain from, right? So, so, the re so, so, right, now, right. Okay, so now the Torah says you have to refrain. Yom Kippur is a day of refraining. It's a Shabbat Shabbaton. That's the nature of Yom Kippur. Okay, is a is a day of, of uh, I don't know, is there a word refraining? I don't know, whatever. But it's a day of refraining. Okay, so so now, right? So now the rabbis come along and they define how one is supposed to refrain. I don't know if there is an overall objective to the refraining. I think that might be bordering on uh, on the philosophical. Okay, and and that so all the rabbis are trying to do is is lend structure. To, uh, to the concept of refraining on Yom Kippur. And, and through that, would you You don't suggest that the rabbis that, have come along the wait, same I'm way that they do on but Shabbat? I'm sorry. No, uh, Mr. Prilchowski, keep going. Okay. The rabbis come, come along on Shabbat, and they say these are the Lamed Tet Malachot, and now we're going to come along with uh, as the example that you gave. To try to strengthen the Daraisa of Shabbat. No, no, and so now the, the Testament the Malachos, are coming along and they're trying to do the same thing with the Inuyim by strengthening fast eating and refraining from eating and drinking. So eating I, I and will drinking is think not Lama, enough. Uh, listen, I think that the Lama Test Malachos themselves are Daraisa, right? And the rabbis are not defining that what they right. are for us. Those we learn from Sukkim, the Gemara asks, Minon, where do we get them from? Right? So each one we learn out. Help, so it's not, it's not the same thing. They're helping thing. us. The same way that they're helping us by having told us of the Av Malachot, they're helping us in terms of fasting and not drinking on Yom Kippur by saying, on a derisive level, that's ideal. But we need to reinforce it somehow by adding these four new you. I, I don't think that's what's happening here. I think that what's happening is that, that they're defining for us what they are. I think that's what the Ron is saying. It's it's defining, not not uh not instituting. I think that's the idea. Right. So so I think my question that said a little bit different is the the rabbis, do we presume that the these four are now the single best way to refrain, or we do we just presume they, you know, decided on four refrains, and that becomes the kind of additional mitzvah of Yom Kippur, and it doesn't matter if they, let's say, got them right or not; they're now right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not it's not that they're right. It, it, God gave it to them. 
God said, you define it, not like, hey, try to figure it out. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's, uh, for instance, an example. The to God says, God says he can't cook a kid in its mother's milk, right? God did not say, now, rabbis, you define what that means. There was an objective definition, right? And the rabbis teach us that definition, but they're defining for us, right, what God had said. Here, what the rabbis are doing is they're providing the structure, right? right? They're, they're saying this is what it should be, okay? It's not that they're creating it on their own. God has handed it off them. It's a, it's a middle ground between the two. Mm -hmm. that's, the, uh, that's the idea, okay? So what's unique about the mitzvah Shabbos and Yom Kippur that's not, that's different than uh, Shabbos and Yom Tov, right? So, so it's here, what's different, the Shabbat Shabbaton, what's different about the Shabbat Shabbaton than the regular Shemitah on every Shabbos and every Yom Tov is here, there's an extra refrain that has to happen, right? In order to meet up to the nature of the day. And that's why the Rambam, right? That's why the Rambam calls Yom Kippur, Hilchos Shemitah Sasar, right? Right? Why is it called the resting of the tenth? Right? Because that's really the mitzvah of the day. The mitzvah of the day is, is refraining. That's what Yom Kippur is really all about. That's the nature of Yom Kippur, is that it's a day that we refrain. Right? So, and, the, and now, so uh, mostly, what's the paradigm that we refrain from? Right? So there are two. There's not doing work like we have on Shabbos, right? Like on a regular Shabbos, we're not allowed to do work. But then there's another refrain that we have. What are the other refrains? Those are the four, right? That's the Shabbaton. So that's what makes Yom Kippur so unique, right? And that's why the day is called Shvisas Asar, because the, the nature of the day is refraining on Yom Kippur, right? So maybe you'd ask you, what's Yom Kippur all about, right? So you, on a philosophical level, you'd say it's a day of atonement, right? It's a day of uh, purification from sin. But on a, on a halachic level, if I'd say, what's the, what are the halachos here? What's my answer? The office is a day of uh, that I refrain from doing things. That's what it is on our walk day. Okay. Um, okay. So now we understand why the Rambam has to bring in Shabbat Shabbaton in his discussions of Inui, right? Because it's really clarifying that you can't understand what eating and drinking is um, in terms of what the prohibition of eating and drinking is, what, what fat and what the midst of fasting is, unless you can compare it and contrast it with the other four. Right. Once I understand that that eating and drinking and fasting exists differently than the other four, so that's why the rabbi brings it in in a somewhat of a confusing way. But it's only confusing when I don't understand the differences between fasting and the other four pro, uh, the other four things that I uh, rephrase. Right. That's the only uh, the other four shvitzos. That's the only time I, I. That's why the rabbi has to bring it in because I can't really understand. Okay. Um, okay. So, so uh, now the question is, right, what, uh, what role did, uh, does it play when it comes to atonement, right? So it, what it does is this, the Yom Kippur, the day itself of Yom Kippur is Izman Shuva Lakol, right? Yachidu L'Rabbim, the Rabbim says in source number 16, right? So it's a, uh, it's a day, I don't, did I give you guys source number 15 and 16? Not on the sheet here. Okay, so, so Yom Kippur is a day of uh, of tshuva, Yachid Rabin. Okay, and who kates mechilo slichol Yisrael? The day that Bnei Yisrael are uh, are forgiven. Okay, so on this day, the entire experience of the day lends to that. Okay, the entire experience of the day lends to the uh, to the day of uh, of tshuva and vidui. How so? Because when I refrain from other things, that enhances my uh, my move of tshuva and, and vidui. Okay, um, okay, and Shabbat Shabbaton, right? So regular Shabbat is, uh, is resting from Malacha Sabuda, right? From, uh, from creative work that they have on every Shabbos. The double Shabbaton means refraining from other actions as well, okay? Um, okay, so, oh, and now we understand why if fasting re uh, receives karis, the punishment is karis, because it's much more significant, it's much more serious. Right, because it itself is its own category, it's its own daraisa. While these four are extensions, right? They're they're refraining, but not they're not their own unit. They're not their own idea. Okay, so they don't have the same sort of a uh, sort of punishment. Okay, um, okay, that's uh, that's but, Rabbi. On that last on that last point, are is that the system, so to speak, that 
something Daraisa that is spelled out is kare, something that was uh, alluded to and given to the rabbis to build out the framework is not kare. That, that's what's happening here. That's not always the case because not every not every single thing is going to have uh, kare to it. But but I would say it like this: if the rabbis are defining it, it cannot have kare. Got it. That's what I would say. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, hey, hey, Rabbi. Yeah. So if the, the other four aren't the same, they're not, it sounds like they're really refraining. They're not pain. So why do we group them together and call them like the five pains if they're I don't know. different? I don't know. That's what that's, I, 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 you know what? And when I looked it up, yeah, I looked it up to, to try to find, you know, like, okay, so where's this found that we call these the Hey Nuyim? I couldn't find any primary sources that really call it that. I think it's a misnomer. Now, thank you for bringing that up because that's how I introduced it that way. I, I really don't understand. I don't, I don't get it. That's, that's the biggest thing to me. You come into this sugya and you think to yourself, there's, there, are, there are five million, right? And if you approach it that way, as a, right? let's say I would approach it and say, okay, you know what? This Yom Kippur, I want to understand the, uh, the, five, the five things that I do, right? So the five things are I don't do, right? So I want to understand those five unique isura that only apply on Yom Kippur. Okay, so I'm gonna and I'm gonna try to understand how they relate one to the other. I don't think you come to the real understanding of where they come from, unless you happen to run into the Sefer Mitzvahs, right? And then you ran into the Ran, and you ran into that, right? It's if you work backwards, I don't know if you're gonna be able to understand it. I think it's only working by this way, which is why it's the first time I really understood it this way, is because I approached it to try to define the mitzvah. Once I tried to define the mitzvah and saw that these four are not part of the mitzvah at all, so that's when I that's when you notice that they're that they're really somewhat different. So I don't know why, I mean, look, I can understand why you call them the five inuim on a colloquial level, because there are five things we don't do on Yom Kippur, and they seem to be painful, right? Walking without shoes is painful, right? Refraining from intimacy is painful, right? And so that seems to be, that that's just like not eating and drinking. They're all painful, right? So that's, that's a, there's, a, so there's a level of discomfort in all of them. Okay, I get it. On a colloquial level, on a halakhic level, I don't see it. Do you think that's why the Rambam groups them in that first mitzvah because they're they're similar? Because, like you said, your first question is it should be in, those other four should be in the Shabbaton mitzvah. Like, so why does he why does he even mention them in that first mitzvah? I think so I he, think I think he mentions them because in order to understand inui of achila v'shtia, like in order to understand fasting, you have to contrast them to the other four, and I think that's why he brings them up. Right, because in order to understand the, the fasting, I have to understand what it's not like. It's not oh. like these other things. That's that's what I would say. Okay, good. Okay. Uh believe that there next next week we'll do the uh the sugya of uh, preparing for sukkis, Shvisa on Yom Tov. Right, understanding the Shvisa on, on each of the Yom Tov. That's what hopefully we'll uh, we'll do. Okay. Rob, I can't if, if we're wrapping up, do you have a, a minute to answer a question that's tangential to this? Yeah, uh, yeah should I t stop the recording or? No, no, no. Okay. I mean, people can stay on, drop off, I don't care. Uh, but it's it's just tangential. Uh, Scott and I were actually learning something and um, it just kind of connected to this in some way. So okay. it, seems, it seems like, uh, and I'm, I'll probably say this incorrectly, but I think you'll understand it. Um, so it seems like Rambam has uh, this concept that the categories of mitzvah or the, the top level mitzvah is kind of uh, the goal. And then the, the details of the mitzvah below that are somewhat arbitrary from God, not arbitrary from our standpoint, but they were just built out because they're necessary to keep the main mitzvah. The, am I getting close enough that you understand where I'm I, talking I, about? Yeah, I just don't, I don't, I've never heard that before. Okay, so I'll point you to the, uh, in Ju we touched on it in Ju Judaism Reclaimed, um, and it's a chapter on it of basically are all the details of a mitzvah, not only, they were of course necessary, but are they, uh, Scott, would, how would you say it? Are they kind of essential and objective, or they are only essential to the global category of the mitzvah? And it, they could have been any uh, answer or any detail. It's just that God chose those details. Scott, any, did you do better than I do? I mean, 
the thing is, I don't know if we want to, this is going to be a long conversation, so maybe we should. Right, all I'm, try, all I'm trying to do is get Brad Kolachowski to, to know what I'm talking about, and then I can ask the easy question, so to speak. Yeah, but I got a problem, because I don't understand what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Why don't we do this another time? I think, um, okay. That's fine. Rabbi, though, on, on this shiur, one more question. So the Ron, what the Ron said, you know, that basically we got from Doraisa this thing to, you know, um, to refrain or a Shabbaton, and then the, he gave it to, they gave it to, God gave it to the rabbis to decide. Do we see this elsewhere, like in the Torah? Yeah, this, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So I just gave it, I gave a shiur on it. Um, where I'll give you three other examples. I think three. Um, yeah, so first is you have it when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to Hilchos Cholamoid, exact same thing. There's some sort of, you're not allowed to do stuff on Cholamoid. What are you not allowed to do? Same thing, hand it over to the rabbis. Okay, where the base Yosef, when he, when he posits that as the explanation of how we get to the prohibitions on Cholamoid, he actually quotes this Ron. Okay, so that's uh, that's one example. A second example is Shvisa on Yom Tov. Ironically, we're not going to really pay too much attention to it next time, but that's another example. I think, sorry, let me rephrase. I think that's what's happening in Shvisa on Yom Tov because I think the Ramban says something similar enough, but not not really. But another time where it's explicitly stated, the base Yosef says it when it comes to there's a prohibition called of not following the ways of Gentiles. So when it comes to not following ways of Gentiles, so the Beis Yosef questions how it is that the rabbi said that if you have a meeting with a government official, you're allowed to uh, you're allowed to wear the clothing of the Gentiles. That's all up. So the Beis Yosef questions, how can you do that? You're being lenient on a Torah prohibition, right? After that, the rabbis come along and allow that. And the Beis Yosef's answer is um, is that no, it's it's really that there's a concept that you're not allowed to do. And the Torah gave it over to the rabbis to define, and therefore they were able to be lenient in certain areas. Thank you. No, that's yeah, good that's because it's you know corroborating it. If this was like a one-time thing, like right, like, it's a little strange. Like you know, but, right, really like thing. about it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. I wonder. I am curious if there are other examples. I haven't run into any. The Bukhukosei will say lechel. It's interesting because uh, I was discussing. The only way I saw that I didn't come up with that on my own. I saw it because I was discussing this with one of my nephews, this whole sugya. Um, and, and then the, like the next day he's studying for smicha, he ran into that base Yosef. So he texted me right away. He goes, hey, it shows up in another place also. Not, I always thought it was just Chal Moed and then and Yom Kippur. And then my finish was that it applies to, to Yom Tov as well. Um, and then he came along and said, oh, look, here's another place. So yeah, so it is consistent. I'm assuming there are other places also. I just don't know. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah, we're great. Okay, all the best. Take care.